Welcome to the Racing Pigeon International Podcast. We talk about everything racing pigeons, the latest news, results, events, and interviews from around the world. So today on the RPI Podcast, we have the former CEO, Ian Evans. Ian was with uh, the RPRA for a number of years, and I'm really pleased that he's uh, agreed to be on this new RPI podcast. How are you doing, Ian? I'm good, thanks, Mark. And yourself? I'm all good, yeah. I'm all good. I'm uh, I'm very pleased that you uh, asked, when I asked, you, you agreed to come on. And um, yeah, the, the podcast is uh, already, although I haven't really started pushing it, it's, it's already getting a lot of listeners and... Uh, I think it's a good way of cutting through because it's audio and video. It's a, it's a new way and it, the syndication of it all, it's, it's, it's looking good. So yeah, thank you for good. Being, uh, good. my first, uh, my first guest on it. So well, let's get I have the privilege of being your first guest. That's great. Yeah. 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 Well, and it is for me as well. So let's get into it. Um, so you spent about five years the CEO of the RPRA? Yeah, it would have been six years in November, so just over five and a half years before I finished. Yeah. So how do you think your time went there? Um, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I'm glad I did it. Um, when I was offered the job, um, I was still debating whether or not to take it. I decided to take the plunge. As you know, I've kept pigeons all my life. thought I had something to offer. Um no, I had something to offer and still think I've got something to offer the fancy, you know. Um, and I'm still going to support the pigeon racing community down in South Wales as much as I can. And hopefully by the time this podcast goes out there, you know, this should, this should be a move towards helping channel racing resurrect itself in South Wales, which I'm which I'm involved in. Um, but in terms of where I went, plenty of positives, some negatives. Um, but I think I made, I made a difference the time I was there, especially around during times of COVID. Um, the fact we were the first competitive sport underway on the 1st of June 2020, a massive achievement. Um, not achieved by myself. Um, we had a, a team around us of the present at the time, David Bridges and the vice presidents, John Waters, Gary Cockshot and Paul Amund, all of which put their life and soul into making sure we were getting racing underway for all the membership. Not just the RPRA, I mean, everybody benefited from it. And I think sometimes, although we've that has been recognised by a lot of people, sometimes it's been downplayed by some quarters, shall we say. But um, I know what effort was put into it and what went through getting pigeon racing up and running. And without that team, it wouldn't have happened. You know, it probably wouldn't have happened at all in 2020. So very proud of that achievement. Um, also, you know, when you look at the bird flu issues, I mean, bird flu this year has been, well, it's unprecedented really, isn't it? We still have an outbreak now this time of year, usually by April, end of April, you don't really hear them again till close in the winter, November time. Um, but this year, all over all over Europe has been unprecedented, and we are still in the UK suffering outbreaks now, which has had a, a detrimental impact really on people within the 10 kilometer zones around those outbreaks. But again, I'm very proud of what was achieved there because, you know, when I first came into post, I was very keen to start developing relationships with DEFRA because I could see. You know, everybody could see where this bird flu issue was going. Every year, gradually, it was getting worse. So I thought it was important to start engaging with them. Um, built relationships with some great officers there, um, one of which has got a pigeon racing background in her family. So she, she, she really got it and was very, very helpful. Um, and, I, you know, th- that kind of relationship we built really proved dividends this year. Although a lot of people might not realize it um, without spelling it out to them. Without, without those relationships and improving our adherence to the kind of general license conditions out there on pigeon racing, then there probably wouldn't have been any pigeon racing at all this year because gatherings of many species of birds, poultry and others at the moment are still banned. Um, and of course, a pigeon race is a gathering where pigeons are brought together from all different lofts. And this year, you know, because of, I like to think because of the relationship and, you know, the, re- the requirements we built up and communications we put out with the membership, that risk, which was already a small risk pigeon racing poses to the spread of even influenza, was reduced further. And, you know, there was no delay to start racing this year, which which was great, really. One of the questions I was going to ask was, what's the most positive things you've taken from your time there? But I think you've kind of already addressed it. Certainly outside looking in, 
tackling the COVID situation, just physically being able to get marking of pigeons and racing of pigeons was, again, you you know, the first to be able to get organised sports to do that. Um, the fact that personally for me, I ran up to Sheffield this morning to take my son Zandy's NFC birds for his first, which he's incredibly excited about, his first ever French race. I think that, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I think that's your biggest achievement. I think I, I genuinely, you know, I, I've said publicly, I've, I've, I think you're the, the the best CEO, manager, whatever you want to call the old so the, the 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 sport in the UK has had the RPRA's had. Um, I've, I've I've publicly said I've got a lot of time for you and what you were about and doing. And if anything, your legacy for me personally is. You made sure that we could race continental racing. You got us. That's the biggest thing to me because without without that, that this sport as we know it would have been finished. And and it took. I can't imagine the thousands of collective hours it took to get that done. That for me, what is your biggest thing that you've achieved? And in addition, then you got throat, COVID thrown at you, bird flu. You know. And I don't think people realise the sheer amount of work this stuff takes. If you're dealing with any government agency, it's it can be a ball ache, to say the least. Yeah. But yeah. on such complex things, it, I can't imagine the amount of work. And to me... Yeah, you, you, you're right, Mark. You know, and um, I thought, I suppose I was lucky in a way because I'd spent 20 years previously working in local government, down with Welsh government. So I was used to that kind of environment if you like and you know how what kind of effort that was going to take dealing with with these departments um but also as importantly you know i'd spent 12 years working with the european union as well through through structural funds that were coming into the welsh valleys so i had a i had a little bit of a, an understanding of a way around okay this was still a different challenge you were still de dealing with different people but i like to think you know it did it did help that background i had did help dealing with these the people, these people, and these departments, you know. And coming coming back to COVID, I mean, you know, I, I've read a few comments where people say, "Well, it was the government who decided when racing would start." Government never never decided anything. I mean, if we think back, the government just shut everything down, which made it clearly obvious we couldn't race, so racing was off the agenda. And then nobody was ever going to come to the pigeon racing community and said, "You can start racing next week," or "You can start racing in six weeks' time." It was up to us to build the case in terms of whatever guidance was coming out there in terms of what can and can't be done and making that fit, really, to, to the pigeon racing community. And obviously, it, it meant changing lots of different things around the processes involved and how many people were involved. And, you know, there was a leap, there had to be a leap of faith from, from a lot of people, really. But I think from our, from the team's point of view, and I know the president, the vice president at the time, myself, what was important is that we needed to get pigeon racing up and running as quickly as possible. But more importantly, do it in a way where we won't put anybody at risk from yeah from infection, from the authorities, in terms of, you know, what we were doing was illegal. Um, that was left to us. You know, okay, we did run it past one or two people, like the chair of the old party parliamentary group, but it was nobody ever come back and endorsed anything from a government point of view. We was basically left to get on with it. And, um, you know, there was a few sleepless nights over that, I'll, I'll be honest with you. But ultimately, you know, it stood up to challenge because, believe it or not, you know, there was police except that turned up in marking stations where... Believe it or not, we even had occasions where we had pigeon fancies ringing the police. Um, and the police were attending, attending marking stations. And when they showed the guidance and the processes they were going through, you know, everybody was fine with it. They, they, they thought, great, that, that, you know, that fits with what we, what we need to see. Fine, carry on, be safe, type of thing. So we're very, 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 very proud of that. And coming back to the channel racing issue, um, yeah, it was... Um, it was challenging again because, of course, when we all voted to leave the European Union as a country, one of the things, first things we needed to make sure was try to establish how that was going to impact on pigeon racing in this country. Now, at the time, we left and right up until 2000 and, well, April, uh, 21st of April 2021, the regulations that were in place at the time, uh, Regulation 2013-139, that regulation made pigeons move as part of a race from outside the European Union into the European Union, exempt from any animal health um, requirements. So basically, it would have been business as usual. So 
If we'd left the European Union in 2018, shortly after voting to do so, I can't remember exactly when the vote took place, but if we'd done that in 2018 or 2019 even and left, we would have been able to continue moving pigeons into the European Union, no problem at all. We would have been exempt from any animal health requirements. It was a perfect storm, if you like, because we left the European Union on the 31st of December 2020, and the new regulations came into force, force on the 21st of April. Now, we didn't become aware of those. We were at the club, weren't we? We're no longer in the European Union, really. So we didn't become, we, we weren't aware of those new regulations until probably the end of February of 2021. Um, you know, we'd made approaches to DEFRA and other government departments before that to make sure there was no impact and everything that came back to them say there'd be no impact. Um, so we were going along thinking that was the case. Then, then this all dawned on us and, you know, we were very much on the back foot to start with, but again, we quite quickly made inroads into making the right contacts with people in terms of the European Union. And long story short, from where we were on the 21st of April 2021 to where we are now, I think, again, people perhaps don't recognise what exactly has been achieved. I know there's still things out there which need to be worked through, like the VET requirement at each marking station, but we'll come to that. I think it's as, it's as good as it's going to get, because one thing to say is that none of this would have been achieved unless there was an appetite on the EU side to do it. And to be fair to all the people I dealt with in the EU, they wanted to put something in place that, that could work for us but at the same time recognise that it wasn't going to be as simple as it would be if we were still in the European Union. I mean, even, even the Dutch and the Belgians and the French have requirements they have to meet now, which they didn't before. Um, so we, we couldn't be treated any leniently to what, to what their own member states would be treated. Um, but also the, the willingness of the French, the FCF, so the RPRA equivalent in France, and especially the new president who came on board towards the latter end of last year has been very helpful. And also... You know, especially once things started moving where it was possible, the contacts, the likes of Mark Gilbert. Mark, Mark has put a hell of a lot of work into this. And I, th I think, again, people don't perhaps appreciate that. And I've even seen people criticizing him, um, which I just don't get. Surprise, you know? surprise. Pigeon fanciers criticizing others? Wow. Never. Yeah. yeah, I know. I you know. know, the thing with the, the, the there's a lot of, um, let me think of the right word. Can't think of the right word without swearing. There's a lot of hypocrites in the sport. I've seen people um, writing disparaging things. The fact that Defra have got involved is the biggest mistake ever. Listen, the, the thing, and this is my own personal opinion, I would guesstimate 75, 80% of Pigeon fans in the UK voted Brexit. Roughly, I'd guess that. It's only a guess. It's a wild guess. And when you leave an organisation like the EU, it stands to reason a government organisation or groups of government organisations like DEFRA are going to get involved to move things forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people, I think, I mean, just speaking personally this morning, you know, Yes, Zandi was running around a little bit, getting a little bit stressed. He got everything right that he needed. But in the bigger picture, it wasn't really a major thing. Yeah, he's got to write down all the, the, the birds' vaccination details. Yes, he had to get it registered with the vet, which the vet was, in this case, really good. He even spoke to him at the weekend so he could do this race today. Not actually that much. Yes, the co there's a cost, but again, when the vet visit happens, the people locally will all get together and split the cost. Not not major at all, really. Yeah, that, and that's the way it's got to You know, you, you, I think sometimes people look for problems rather than solutions in the pigeon sport, and perhaps in life generally, but it seems to be more evident in the pigeon sport. I mean, you're right. I mean, the, the vet bills, it is an additional cost there. But again, you know, there's quotes on the RPRA website, which I compiled from, from a number of vets around the country. You know, you're looking at an average a rate of five hundred pound a day. Now, the vets will tell you they don't even they don't even get these lofts long. I mean, they they, they not come in there doing tests, etc. So you, you can get ten lofts quite easily done in a, in a facility where there's lofts quite relatively close together. I, I accept in more rural communities that's going to be probably more difficult. But you know, there, there there are ways and solutions around to reduce that cost, and um, you know. I'm glad. I'm glad to see Zandi's doing it, and I, you know, I'm glad to see that you know all those people who have enjoyed channel racing the, the have, have done so. But coming back to the point you made about Defra, I mean, people saying it was a mistake to get Defra involved. 
the other the other option was not to get DEFRA involved, which yeah. wasn't an option because if you didn't, there'd be no channel racing because the EU regulations mean that DEFRA had to be involved. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you know, you describe it, it wasn't a choice. Really. Yeah. No, you describe it more eloquently than me. I, you know, I said that when this was all kicking off, simple. Want to race the channel? Register with DEFRA. Don't want to race the channel? Or don't want to register with DEFRA? Don't race the channel. Yeah. Simple as that. But yeah. you've got people that um, <coughs> were bad mouthing the RPRA, bad mouthing you for getting DEFRA involved. Like you said, you've got no choice. No. If there's going to be any continental racing, French predominantly racing, this is the way it is. And I think that's still a result considering how it could have been because, you know, it could have been a lot worse. And now you've got people like this weekend, you know, flying French races. And it wasn't – and for anybody listening to this that hasn't done it yet, it was all right. It was easy enough. Once you got everything together, it was easy enough to do. Um, you know, a little bit of paperwork, that's it. And, yeah. and, and again, these uh, – either vet even passed the message on to me because – my, you know, Zandi was stressing about the inspection when it happens, and it's like the guy's going to come round. He's going to check that everything looks all right. He's going to check your written records. He's going to ask you for what medication you've used. That's it. It's not going to yeah. be handling every pigeon and in it, you know. No. So, no. I, I, I think they're basically looking for claims, um, signs of notifiable diseases, which is panamic, so and even influenza. There's no other notifiable diseases, really, that they have to check for. And I say, it's just a visual inspection. So I really don't think it's 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 um, it's a lot to be scared about. Um, I really don't. I mean, some people have related it back to, like, the farming industry and, you know, what happens with poultry. But there's a, it's a totally different process and totally different requirements because this is a registration process. What they go through is an approval process. And it's that approval process that they initially tried to impose on the pigeon racing community for third countries, which obviously wouldn't work. So thankfully, we, we, we managed to get that removed. So you, you, you're comparing apples and pears. It's something totally different. Yes, there's a vet involved, but, you know, they're totally different scenarios. They really are. Um, I just want to make the point about DEFRA. I mean, you know, people say, oh, no DEFRA involved. They want to get involved in inland racing. De DEFRA, DEFRA don't want to get involved in pigeon racing to that degree. I mean... Yeah, I've got the resources to be doing it. That's that's the impression I get. I mean, that hasn't been said to me directly. And I mean, the fact the fact that the fact that they had to be involved. And actually, when you think about it, when you look at the communications we were putting out, we had to put pressure on them to actually speed up this process. I mean, if they were doing it from a point of view where they wanted to get it hand in there, they wouldn't have been having to have pressure from us. They just would have did it. They wouldn't. They wouldn't need an excuse. They could just do it. I would guess DEFRA, that particularly, won't have to be concerned with anything to do with pigeon racing, but we come back to the thing that they have to. It's not, you know, it's not high up on their list of of issues and staffing and resourcing and like you said, you know, so I, I, I think, it, I personally think that's been your greatest achievement along there. I think, I think getting that racing going is, is what I certainly will remember as one of your most positive things. But let's move on to say, do you have any regrets about your time there? Yeah, I, I, have, I do have regrets. I have regrets in terms of I couldn't move it in the direction I wanted it to move, the, the sport in general. Um, I think the RPRA, the RPRA is something we should all be proud of, if I'm honest with you. Um, and I think members don't realise exactly what the RPRA delivers. But it depends how we define the RPRA, doesn't it? What we think the RPRA is. I mean, from, from the point of view of the infrastructure that's put in place at the headquarters and the staff, what well, the staff there deliver, I think that's something to be very, very proud of. Now, the RPRA has got great challenges, and those challenges are not new challenges. They've been there way before my time. I like to think, in terms of financially, um, although the RPRA is, is relatively safe in terms of its level of reserves, it has been making a loss year on year for God knows how long. That's always been masked and, you know, the risk associated with that has been softened by the fact that the British Home World's always made a very, very healthy profit. But again, 
the profits of the British Omen world over years have been dropping. Um, and, you know, I came in, one of the first things I did was put in a competitive tendering process for the printing contract, which I don't think had been done for probably decades. Um, that's a £40,000 in printing, printing cost straight away, which is an astronomical amount of money when we're talking about this kind of thing. Um, we reduced staffing costs at the British Roman world because if we hadn't have done all that, um, the British Roman world would have been making a loss now. You know, um, it, it, it's probably close to making a loss this year, if I'm honest with you. But um, nevertheless, we, the, the RPRA can no longer rely on the British Roman world to kind of prop up the losses the RPRA was making year on, year out. So, you know, over a period of years, I put, a, put together a bit of a, a financial plan, if you like. And again, this was all accelerated during COVID when, you know, a small group of people were given the powers to run the association um, at that point in time because it was recognized the council couldn't regularly do it. So myself, the president and vice president, who I previously named, you know, once racing started getting up and underway and our priority was out the way, we really started as a group having some really serious, and difficult conversations sometimes about, about costs. And how those costs in the RPRA could be addressed without going straight to the membership to put the subscriptions up. Because like any business, the first thing you should be looking at is, you know, in this kind of thing, is instead of passing the cost on to your customers, is looking at how you can reduce your overheads. And, you know, we'd already started the journey. For, well, I'd already started the journey of trying to modernize some of the processes in place at RPRA HQ, but taking some of the online, some of the processes online. Very, very little staffing cost involved in it, automating quite a lot. That allowed me to already start reducing staffing levels at HQ. But, you know, other things accelerated that. But anyway, as a group, we came up with a bit of a financial plan, which we put out on paper to be able to present to the council. And that that included some controversial things, if I'm honest with you. A lot of it's not new. A lot of it, a lot of it um, was in the whole report, which, as you probably all recall, was thrown out. Um, the whole report was one of the reasons I decided to take the job because I'd spent the previous six years with, work, working with social enterprises and I could see clearly, you know, the, the, the successful social enterprises. And the RPI is a social enterprise. It's a business with social aims and objectives at its core, you know, to deliver a service to its members. And quite clearly in those five years, we learned quite early on, you know, that the, the successful social enterprises are the ones with really good governance structure that could react to opportunities and threats quickly. That didn't exist in the RPRA. I mean, the process we have in place, this bottom-up approach, in my opinion, doesn't work. Um, you know, you need to empower a small group of people, really, to make these decisions. But anyway, coming back to the point, th th these, these kind of uh, recommendations included voluntary redundancy package for staff to try and reduce the staff because we'd got to a stage where we'd modernize some of the working practices where we could do that. And I think during my time there, we reduced the staff and level by about four members, full-time equivalents. Um, but more controversially, the other aspect looked around kind of making the governance structure far more financially efficient as well as efficient in terms of making decisions. So, for example, you know, just to put it in perspective, we have 13 regions in the RPRA. Each region has its own expenses to run. Um, and then obviously each region appoints one or two members of council, depending on the size of the regions, to the council. And there's a cost associated running the council. All that equates to about eighty thousand pound a year. That's an astronomical amount of money for for the governance of an organisation when you're talking about something the size of the RPRA. You know, and it was my opinion, and I, and I think I'm right in saying it was the opinion of of the other other four people on the executive committee at the time that that had to change. You know, and once we'd reduced the staffing levels to a certain certain degree, and after we'd reduced the governance structure, any short or the cost associated with the governance structure. Any shortfall should then obviously be picked up by the membership. But there's no way we were going to support going to the membership, asking them to pick that up until we address those costs first. Now, those propositions were put forward. The financial report was put forward. But the regions rejected it, which is not surprising, really, is it? I mean, they go, they go into reject it because they see it as a direct challenge to them. And just to give you some kind of indication, I mean, it wasn't about getting rid of the regions because I, I think, you know, even though I think, we don't need the regions to that degree. And as time will progress, those those regions' requirement will reduce. It's the cost associated with that, with, with running those regions. And a lot of the administrative tasks of regions could be brought in-house without increasing the staffing levels and not no extra cost. So it was just a no-brainer. But all that was rejected. So 
you know, that 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 was a. Um, do you was think a, that uh, was simply we able to get it to that position? Do you think it was simply asking turkeys to go to the slaughter themselves type thing? Is that the main reason? Do you think? Hundred um, percent. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think I think we have to put it in perspective. I mean, the first thing to say, there's some good people in these regions, and there's some good people on council as well. Not a lot of good people, not. But it's the system more than anything that um, holds it back. And I mean, when the region is seeing this coming down as a threat, they 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 are perhaps a bit wary of it, and they perhaps see some people may look at it that is perhaps removing their own position or whatever position they feel they have through this process. And so, yeah, there is an element the turkeys voting for Christmas. But again, you know, the membership, the membership need to take some responsibility here because ultimately, if the membership engaged in the current process just for this one occasion, they could get it changed. The membership took the time to go to these meetings and vote it in. So I get why they don't go there. I mean, it's not something I choose to do in my spare time. So this is not a criticism of the membership. This is just putting across the reality that if people want things to change, because when you take... When you take the view of the membership on an individual basis, for example, should there be one member, one vote? I mean, 95% of the membership will come back, which is proven in the consultation exit, and say, yeah, there should be one member, one vote. But yet when the, when the regions vote on one member, one vote, it's totally flip of that. So the regions and the, and the, the kind of direction of the RPRA doesn't, and that's quite a small example, but, a, but the easiest example to explain, it doesn't reflect what the majority of the membership want. And so you end up with an association that doesn't reflect its membership. I think that's the biggest problem. Do you think that's the single biggest challenge the RPRA has got going forward? The, the RPRA has many challenges going forward. The sport, the pigeon racing has many challenges going forward. Um, we've touched on some of them in terms of bird flu. We all know the raptor issue, and that's that's something else I perhaps regret they couldn't make more inroads into, really, if I'm honest with you, because it's something that's plagued me, you know, where I have pigeons in South Wales since I've had pigeons. Um, but I think we need to get our governance structure right first and foremost before we can start making roads into anything. Now, I know I put the bird of prey issue to one side. I think that's a far more difficult task. But in terms of in terms of modernising without losing the character of the sport, in terms of how it's run in this country, we need to get our governance structure right first because nobody else in this country is going to do it. Like you hear people talk about we need a new union. You don't need a new union. The association itself and what it delivers is good, but it could be so much better. You know, forming another new new union, that's all I mean, done, isn't it? You know, I mean, the, the Northwest Ormond Union, I, I believe, was born out of the frustrations and whatever of, a, of certain individuals, putting it politely. But what does the Northwest Ormond Union deliver for the, for the pigeon sport? Nothing. It sells some rings. Everything else is done through the RPRA, even... Even organisations down here in South Wales were, the f- were uh, affiliated to the Welsh Omen Union. Uh, I won't put the Welsh Omen Union in the same bracket as the North West Omen Union, but ultimately, even the services, even those organisations affiliated to the WHU, benefit from the RPRA. You know, so we just need to make that RPRA bigger and better, really, and more, and to and reflect its its membership more, what its membership wants. To me, it's got to be run as a business. Anything has to be moving forward. It has to be hard facts, financial facts. but and, and the governance structure from a financial point of view doesn't make sense. And from a practical point of view, getting things done. Look, you know, if you want to make something change as, in its simplest terms, go to your club, you put a vote in, you go to your region, the regions vote yes or no. That's a whole political potential nightmare for a start. Mm-hmm. And you said it yourself earlier, the six people during COVID got a hell of a lot more done taking it forward, things that needed be, to be done. And to me, it needs a core group of six to maybe maximum 10 people that that ultimately make the decisions. The, 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 the bottom-up structure does not work. No. Proven it doesn't if- work. <clears throat> and I don't see my, – my fear – for the RPRA going forward is that actually it's not, not going to change. We can be sitting here in five years' time and nothing's really changed. And the numbers are still going down, not not just the finances, it, the, the membership's going down. And still, because of this structure in place, nothing gets done. I, I view you as the CEO. And all, any CEO of a business 
They have a board, yes, but on a practical day-to-day basis, they can make decisions quickly and any major decisions go to the board. The trouble with the board at the moment is they're all shackled to what the membership wants and the membership don't get involved for whatever reason. It should be one member, one vote. It should be, this is coming up for the vote. You can vote by mail, online. Here's how you vote. This is what it should be done. And I know it's a simplistic way of looking at it, but that's how it should be. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. And this region committee, it doesn't work. And it's and, and, and my worry personally is that in five years' time, we'll be talking and not a lot has changed. And that leads me to my next question. But in five years' time, what, what's the RPR going to look like if it carries on the same trajectory? You know, not great at all. No. You know? No. No, I, I mean, th- things have to change. And I think change will, at some point, be forced upon people. But it's, it's again, it's... It, it's this reactive approach rather than proactive all the time. To and, and that's just not the RPR. Like, that's right the way throughout the sport. We are always reacting to problems rather than you know anticipating them and, and and putting plans in place to address them as and when they arrive. You know, um, and, and again that comes down that comes down to the governance structure. It's it's, it's cumbersome and it just doesn't work. You know, for any kind of organisation. Um, as as for the role of CEO, I mean you're right. I mean you have very little authority autonomy to make any decisions. You know, um, and obviously when I took the post, it was known as general manager at the time. And the only recommendation that came out of the whole report that was implemented was to change that job title from general manager to CEO, which meant nothing. It meant nothing because my role and my authority didn't change with that. It was just changing a couple of words in the rule book, which is pointless. Mm. Where do you see the sport at in the UK? Being in five and ten years' time, um, I always try to be positive about the sport. If I'm honest with you, um, I think the sport will always survive. But we, I mean, we can't hide from the from the obvious. Participation is declining at a rate of knots. Um, Back in the eighties, I think there were sixty thousand members in the RPRA. It's probably eighteen thousand, well, less than eighteen thousand now this year. Um, That that rate of decline. I think I started to level off, um, but nevertheless, it's far too big. That rate of decline is far too big. And I mean, again, it comes back to the way the, the sport has been promoted. And again, this is not a criticism of anybody because I think as a sport, I mean, Chris Sutton puts it very over very well. It's a, I think it was Chris Sutton's editing. It? It's a sport that takes place behind closed, door, behind closed doors and above people's heads. Nobody knows it exists. So why would you pick up a sport you don't know it exists? Now, years ago, things were different. The communities were different. I mean, I can remember as a kid, you know, everybody went to the local workman's club. And where was, where, was the lo- where was the pigeon club? The pigeon club was in the local workman's club. So you had a shop window, so to speak. So people knew the sport existed. Now people don't tend to go to the workman's clubs or where the pigeon clubs are or very few people. Now, it's not, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. But that's just... One example of why the sport's declining. People don't know it exists, so why would you take a sport that we don't know exists? And that comes back to one of the other things, you know, I was I was keen to put in place um, when I arrived there it was something to start trying to promote the sport and take it to the, the people, to certain targeted audiences who could take up the sport. Now, Richard Chambers, obviously, at the time, before I took up the role, he was already delivering a school-based project. He was a teacher in Staffordshire, had a pigeon loft there. Very successful. Some children took up the pigeon sport because of it. And then we know we're not talking thousands or hundreds of people, but nevertheless, people took up the sport who nevertheless wouldn't have through that project. So the challenge was, from my point of view, to, to kind of replicate that. And we had we had a fund set aside, which is generate the future of the sport fund, which is generated from the profit set up at the one off race. And that was just basically again going into one big pot, masking the losses of the RPRA every year. Well, you know, why have a future sport fund if you're just going to keep adding to it every year or do nothing from a strategic point of view? Try and change it. So, so the project idea, basically building on the success of Richard's project. Um, Richard, we were lucky enough to get Richard to come on board with us. I mean, Richard's a fantastic guy in terms of, you know, being able to deliver this project. The passion and enthusiasm he has is, well, you know, there's no, no boundaries, really. And I mean, quite quickly, he was able to kind of, 
spread that around the country. But again, I must m- mention, I've been Oswald Twistle, uh, Peter Argreaves, who, you know, he, 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 the job he's done up there, he proves what can be done in the pigeon sport. I think, you know, and, and Peter was one of the first people I went and met when I was in the job. I drove up there to meet him. And I mean, what he's done in a local area is unbelievable. I mean, that club was someone like, I mean, don't quote me on his figures, but just in his example, was someone like six members. It's now 50 members. A lot of those people who joined the club never raised pigeons before. So it proves it can be done. It, you know, this this thing that the sport is dying. The sport's not dying. The sport's committing suicide. That's what the sport's doing. It's not it's not dying. So coming back to Richard's project, obviously we know we invested a little bit of money. I, I wrote a project idea and, and convinced the Future Sport commit, Committee and the council to, to back it. We set a budget of £60,000 a year. Uh, Rumours quickly started spreading that Richard was getting £60,000 a year salary. Um, he wishes. Um, you know, he's coming in for a lot of criticism, but the project works. I think we've got eight pigeon lofts in schools around the country. And again, if it weren't for COVID, I think that would be double that by now because the, the project started to gather momentum. And then and then a lot of the word was getting out there where schools were spreading this around. When people were coming to Richard, you know, interested in there, and Richard was going in and meeting the governors and giving a talk to the children. And, you know, it was really gaining momentum. But COVID, it, everything shut down and, and that stopped. And, and we, and Richard had to kind of start that um, process again. But then, you know, the people who are tasked with securing the future of the sport, which is what I see, which is the council and ultimately the committees of the council, there's people on there who even you can demonstrate that a project is working, want it to end. Now, I just simply cannot get my head around that. What we should be doing is saying we have a project here which is working. It's costing sixty thousand pound a year, but that's not coming out in the membership pocket. That's coming from the future, from the profit on the one-off race. So we should be making it better, not putting things in the way. Barriers what's their in the way. We should be analysing it and making it better. What's their justification for wanting it to end? Because, in my opinion, in my opinion, the reason they want it, they, they want to get rid of it, is because. They see it as another way of protecting the future of the regions and the council from the point of view that I'm saying the council and the regions are costing £80,000 a year. Well, there's £60,000 that we can get rid of there and, and protect our own future. That's my opinion. Rather cynical opinion. Um, but nevertheless, and, and, that, and that's not an opinion of, again, I must stress this. That's not the opinion of everybody on the council or every region. There's some very forward thinking and very supportive people on some of the regions and on council. But as a group, and some regions want to see nothing, in my opinion, they want to see nothing progressive. They want to, they want to maintain the status quo. And why would you want to maintain something that doesn't work? I just don't understand it. I think, I think there's a, an issue with certain mem- areas of the membership of harking back to the old days and how things used to be done, how things have always been done. And and that's a major issue because in every single way, shape or form, there's no resemblance of what life was back in 30 years ago when the, the membership was 60,000 plus people. And I would hope, and again, I'm speaking personally, I would hope that uh, over a period of time, just naturally, this resistance to be progressive will go because people will fall off. Anybody that is is regressive in thinking will over a period of time be out of that structure um but my worry is is that is that going to be happening quick enough in that i I think i think i think the answer to that is no because if it happened quick enough it would have already happened um but it's never too late is it you um, said that the membership is leveling off a little bit, but there reaches there's, there's a tipping point as to where at some point that membership cannot, even if it stayed the same, that f- even forgetting going up for a minute, but at some point it is not sustainable. Yeah, the membership is not leveling off, but the rate of decline is is slowly decreasing. But you're you're right. I mean, I mean. You you see around the country, there's some clubs which have existed for 50, 60 years, sometimes sometimes longer than that. You know, those clubs can no longer function. And once that club is gone in that area, there's no opportunity for the other people, is there? And so the, if there's just a small group of people in that area racing pigeons, they give up. So it does accelerate. The, I, I see where you're coming from. But again, 
It's about addressing that. And it's about introducing more and more people to the sport. And the only way you're going to get out to do that is by taking it out there. I, I, I'm, you know, I was never of the attitude when I went for the interview. I was never of the attitude while I was in the job. And I'm still not of the attitude that we should just sit back and accept it. You know, we should be doing things to promote it. And that, and that should be done via the RPRA. Isn't, I have no doubts about that whatsoever. That's where it needs to be driven. You know, we need a strategic project or process of getting out there. As I say, Richard's project's not perfect, but, you know, it was very much in its infancy. We just need to build on that, and we need to secure the future of the sport. I agree. I mean, I, I posted on Facebook. I post on Facebook, I, and I posted yesterday waiting for uh, – that I was sitting there all bit with my laptop outside waiting for a pigeon to come back from an open race that Zandy had gone in. And a guy in America posted uh, – you should do some simple videos about how the sport works because people don't know. People don't know it's worked on velocity and people don't even know that they've, a lot of people don't know they fly back to their own lofts. Well, how does that happen if they're all different distances? And I love, albeit one or two people within my social media connections that have nothing to do with pigeons. I have a crossover of, of on Facebook of pigeon people. And I love people actually engaging with it because you are turning people onto the idea of it actually being a sport i i've got an idea for a video that at some point i want to do um it'll be called athletes of the sky and i want to put up pictures of saying think this is a pigeon put up a a, a street pecker think this is a pigeon not a street pecker no that's com- like comparing you know Dartmoor ponies with a racehorse. This is a racing pigeon. Really impactful videos of them flying. Really impactful videos of how long they fly. When when people when you say, "Oh, it's a hundred mile race this week," I've people that long. No, these yeah. pigeons fly six seven hundred miles. That's that's yeah. in in the picture of the sport. It's nothing, you know. Yeah. Um, there's so much that can be done. And, and when I get on it, thinking it, I, you know, I'm, I'm an ideas person, and, and and I think there's so much that can be done. But then, as sad as it sounds for me, I come back to I, I, I've started the podcast because I wanted to do something different. I, I did miss doing my my shows, but at the same time, doing it at a specific time every week was prohibitive. This is great; we can record it. Ask people to bring questions in before and it's good and, and and i said you know what i'm going to do it again it's, it's different and it, in theory can get more exposure around the world just because of how podcasts are syndicated um it's like i've been collecting these milo pigeons uh as another example i've got about 40 of them i got most milers anybody's got in the country and i've been collecting them up as they come available because again if Half the pigeon people you'd speak to say, that's not pigeon racing, pigeons flying a mile. Well, hang on a minute. Who's to decide that actually that isn't? Is it? Are they competing? Yes, they are. Is it only a mile? Yes. Does it have to be a mile? No, it could be five or ten mile even. Um, that particular side is dead because it, it involved people community having a community of lofts, a, a small piece of land with multiple loss on it very prohibitive from a point of view but can something be done uh potentially yes it can it, it doesn't have to be exactly as it was um but i've been collecting them up because i still think there's there's something in that imagine on a sunday i mean i i've heard stories of people up in yorkshire barnsley area they used to go around four or five different of these minor races uh, in yeah. a sunday and it's done and dusted. In 10 minutes, it's finished. Yeah. Now, imagine that to be able to say, yeah, we're having a, a, a mile of competition on Sunday. Anybody's welcome to come along. Yeah, That's getting closer to racehorses. Yeah, race I agree with you. Yeah. Because it's done and dusted. So there's so many things that can be done. I naively, you know, often on I've been involved, despite what people think, for 30 three years in the prison. I kept my first race in prison when I was 13. I'm unfortunately 47 now. But I naively came back in. I still got the British Home in World every week while I was out of the sport. I came back in. You know, we spoke We spoke many times. 
in you know 2000 early 2019 and i did the first ever live show people loved it but i reached a point where i just had enough of the abuse and the hassle um you know i'd had enough mm, yeah yeah and then you ask yourself what are you doing it for yeah the great thing with the podcast is it gets recorded. Yeah, I, I put out like I did yesterday on social media. If I've got, if anybody's got any questions for Ian, let me know. Great, but that's it. I've not got people yeah. tuning in to give me a hassle. You listen to it, you hate me. You can still listen to it, but I don't have to get the feedback as such, the negative feedback. And and the people that like what you're doing, I'll tell you what they're doing. And I just got worn yeah. down with absolutely everything going on, and I came to it saying, well. You know, I personally, I'm helping Zandy with the racing. It's affecting Zandy and his racing. And I just got to a point where I'm like, you know, life's too short for this stuff. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for how long you stayed in the job because I have said to you privately before, you couldn't pay me any amount of money to do what you did. Cause no, and, and I think I probably stayed in there longer than I – longer than um, – I anticipated because I, I thought I'd be there for a lot longer. When I took the job, but you know, I thought I'd be there for a lot longer than I was. But you know, I would have gone in December. I think I think we may have had this conversation previously, Mark. I would have gone in December last year. The only reason I didn't go in December last year was because I wanted to see through channel racing. It would have been irresponsible for me to to have left at that point in time. And so, you know, I needed the for, for you know for my own motives and and, and the responsibility I felt to everybody. I needed to stay there till it was done, and it's no coincidence that after we successfully completed the um, the trial run across the France, which again drew some criticism, which perhaps you want to touch on later on. Um, as soon as that we did that on the Friday, I put my resignation on the Monday. I thought, right, that's it. Now I'm out. I've, I've done. I've done what I wanted to do and what I needed to do, and I need to go. You know. So, well, you, you touch on the trial thing. My limited understanding of it is you organize the trial between a few group of flyers the trial happened and you told them what the results of the trial was the membership mm. that's it mm. but that again any excuse to moan this is not right it's supposed to be open and honest public you know, all of this transparency what happened to I, I saw all the comments listen we did a trial and by nature of it being a trial we only needed a certain amount of people we got those people that agreed to do it at their own time expense and expense, whatever. Yeah. And, 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 and that's the important thing. It was at their own time and expense. Okay. It, I support, I supported it from as much as I can. So I suppose there was a cost there, but really speaking, my involvement was very, very limited. I mean, you know, I think it's common knowledge now. It was, it was Mark really the, you know, okay. I might've put the idea across, but Mark was the guy who went out there and delivered it along with David Parsons, the vet who has been, also been great uh, the last few months leading up to getting channel racing going ahead. Um, you know, it, it was very much at their own cost. I mean, it wasn't something we could open up to the membership generally because it would have been irresponsible to have done that trial run with a, with a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand pigeons. It would have been irresponsible to have done that. Again, you know, it was all new to the French border control staff. It was new to us. It was new to the FCF who had to be involved. So it had to be limited, you know. Uh, and I've got to be honest with you, I, I'm, not, I'm not naive, especially after six years of working with the RPRA, but I was naive and I was a bit taken aback by the negativity that it got. And I thought to myself, yeah, it's tight. It, you know, it's, I am making the right decision here because if somebody can see the negative in that, what do you need to do? I don't get people's mentality. I don't get it. It's, it was a trial. It was a limited trial. These are the results. That's what happened. You would have told. You would have said the result. I had people. Oh yeah, they wouldn't have said if it went wrong. Yes, you would. You yeah. would have, you would have said. Yeah. You would have had to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you would have wanted to to let people yeah. know. And yeah. It's this mentality. I, I've said. You see, I've said before. I think I'm in the wrong country for my ideas for the sport. Because you look at other areas of the world, like where well, Gabby's Romanian, so I've got a connection with Romania. It's growing at a massive rate. Yeah. Oh, forget China. China is a whole different ballgame. <laughs> Countries like that, it's growing. Before we uh, get going away a little bit from the RPRA um, to more other stuff, but well, now a couple of more questions if that's all right. I know we, we're yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's all right for time. Here's one that 
I'm going to smile while I ask you the question. <laughs> if you were to give a, one piece of advice to whoever becomes the new CEO, what would it be? Oh, well. Um, <laughs> Take your that's a, medication or? <laughs> that's, a really that's a really difficult one. That's a really difficult one. Um, I, I don't know, Mark, if I'm honest with you. I, I mean, I think... I think if 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 I was applying to the job now, knowing what I know, I think I'd want to before I accepted the job, I'd want to make sure that there was a commitment to go in a certain direction. So perhaps there needs to be a conversation up front in terms of where the council or the regions see the sport going and, and how we're gonna get there. Because, you know, I didn't. I didn't do that, but I felt I didn't need to do it from the point of view that when I was interviewed, I was very critical of the RPRA, very, very critical. I made the point at the time that the association is not representative of its membership feelings, and I still maintain that. I have spent six years trying to change that, and I failed. Um, I also, I also spoke to the consultants who were carrying out the all report. They were coming to the end of it, and you know, I wanted to speak to them before for um, taking on the job or being committed to the job because, you know, I had my own ideas where, where it needed to go, which we've discussed. And it was music to my ears when I spoke to them because I said, yeah, this is, this is everything I've learned over the last six, seven years. I, I agree with everything you're saying, you know. Um, it, it needs to be streamlined. We need to start cutting the overhead costs. You know, we need to start empowering a small group of people and we need to engage the membership more. I mean, that's just... I just can't see why anybody would have a problem with that. So I, I think my advice would be, you know, before doing it, establish some boundaries right from the out. But that'd be that'll be difficult to do with, with the structure the way it is anyway. I um I'm in a WhatsApp group. I won't mention him. Somebody said I was going to apply for it, but I missed the deadline. He would have been a very good pick in my opinion. He's a business minded. I um. And I'm not talking about RL either. RL's um, going on. To, speaking of RL, RL got involved in uh, really trying to progress things forward. Um, was heavily involved. Successful businessman in his own right. Wasn't doing anything for the money. Spent a lot of time doing it with the NFC. All, all, lots of stuff he was doing. Really, yeah, like Zandi's very. Going back to Zandi again for a minute as an example. Zandi's very first ever NFC race, which he was so excited about, old hens race. And uh, RL sent him a postcard of congratulations with his pigeon, personal, him holding his pigeon on it. Really great stuff. You know, thinking outside of the box, thinking like a businessman, but with the idea of he wasn't doing it for the money. He doesn't need the money. And then, however many months ago, what, I see a Facebook post that immediate, effective immediately, I'm resigning from all of my posts. Why? I knew why. Because it's sicker of the hassle. Hmm. And I said, it's just the same as me. We're doing what I was trying to do. And I'm not saying I, you know, was trying to, I was doing anything majorly. He was doing really important things within groups. But there's that. I think you can get beat down by things, certainly within the UK. And and I know every country that, that is in this sport can have its issues, but I think the the new CEO has to be business minded like you you are, you were. But until that governance structure changes, they're gonna get then my own personal opinion is nothing's gonna change. We'll be speaking. I, 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 I agree with you, Mark. I think I mean thing, thing, things will change, but but I mean things changed in my time there and things changed in my predecessors' times. But they're not gonna change at the rate that's needed, really, unless that governance structure is right. And just just to touch on that again, you know, wherever the new CEO is, really, it should on the this on the there should be an executive committee, no doubt about it, and it should be the CEO and, and perhaps president and the vice presidents, and perhaps even then that's too many. But I think more importantly, again, more I learned in my role previously working with businesses and supporting businesses before the RPRA, is that, you know, you might have four or five people on that committee, but you shouldn't just think that that four or five people have all the like, skills and knowledge that's needed. So 
if you've got a project or if you've got a problem or if you've got an opportunity in whatever field that is, you co-opt somebody onto that committee temporarily who has the relevant skills to be able to deliver it. Much much like we did, much like we did with channel racing. You know, there was people there was people out there we knew could help. You know, as things progress, we knew Mark Gilbert with his contacts with export and imports and whatever, and you know, his his contacts with the pigeon world. You know, so Mark, you know, uh, Mark was okay. Mark was in regular contact anyway because he wanted no updates. But you know, when when he, when he was asked to get involved, or well, he didn't even have to be asked to get involved. But that, what I'm trying to say is, 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 is having the right people, the right skills, at the right time to be able to help. Not not just thinking you've got the answers to everything because quite clearly we haven't. But so if you've got a building project, for example, you bring somebody on who's an architect, or you bring somebody on who's a project manager in building. You outsource them. What, you know, that is there. Outsource things for specific projects. They don't bring a full time member of staff for that. They outsource it. It gets done. Mark, you know, I got a lot of time for Mark. Mark, you know, again has his knockers. I think that's a lot of jealousy based stuff. But again, behind the scenes, nobody else working harder to help get this yeah. stuff done. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, good luck. And, and great, and thank you to him. Some of the comments that were coming through uh, one of my WhatsApp groups is the RPA, RPRA needs to be run like a company. How do we remove the old guard? Um, somebody else said the majority of his answers will be, uh, we tried X, Y, and Z, but ultimately down it's down to the fanciers, and it goes out to the vote, and most don't vote. I think that kind of summarizes the issue. Yeah. I mean, most people... There's probably less than one percent of the membership making the decisions because there's only less than one percent engaged in the process in terms of turning up at the region meetings. And again, as I said, I, I, I get it. I get it why they don't. I don't want to spend my Sunday running around the country to attend the meeting, you know. But I think if they want things to change and if they're asking questions, I mean, I don't like the derogatory term or oh guard. I mean, as I say, there's a lot of lot of good people on that on that council. You know, if, if you want change, let's put it that way, then the answer is simple. You engage in the system. You, you put yourself out and you go along to the meetings. And if you're not happy with what you are representative from your region is doing, then you vote them off and put somebody else there. It's as simple as that. People need to do it. People mm. need to do it. Uh, the old guard thing was a direct uh, quote. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know that. Um, for me, one of the big issues is... Um, we could speak for hours, and maybe at some point we can get back on. Because I also want wanted, and we're not going to have the time on this episode to talk to you more specifically about your past with uh, getting into you know, how you got into sport, and 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 not necessarily so RPRA focus. So maybe we'll do another one if you're up for that. Yeah, um, yeah. because I want to get this podcast to be giving thoughts and ideas to people listening to it in the sport. Yeah, so no problem, Mark. Yeah, realistically, we're not going to have time to go down that route today. But with that in mind, we'll carry on and keep this episode how it's been. To me, one of the biggest problems uh, going on within the RPRA, I hear it all the time, a, a whole discussion in my RPI WhatsApp group got started, which I didn't invite you to because I didn't think you would appreciate <laughs> being invited, um, was this issue of joining clubs people yeah. being refused membership to me i again don't get it it makes no sense clubs changing their radi their boundaries their radiuses to keep people out what is the you know jealousy fear of getting beat i think personally any member that's an rpra member should be allowed in a club unless they've been proven to have cheated, proven, not all work, you know, uh, and maybe a couple of other uh, criteria. Uh, but apart from that, people should be allowed in and radiuses should be opened up more. I mean, I've heard people travelling miles and miles just to race their pigeons on a Friday night when they've got a club four miles from them. And I don't, I don't get it. But how do you see that being able to change? Because uh, there was a whole debate going on on this group yesterday about one person was saying, who I've got a lot of time for, was saying, 
Um, so one person was saying, if you are an RPRA member in good standing, you should be allowed to join any club you want. Somebody else said that would make even more clubs fall down because then you'd have clubs breaking up and you'd have people leaving because a member was, had to come in and they didn't like them. I don't get that personally myself. I think if you're a member of the RPRA in good standing, you should be allowed to join any club within a radius, a radius. And that radius is not like that. A set radius, I mean, I don't even really get the points. Right? I mean, I know practically on, from a racing point of view, there's, there's the need for radius, but the radius should be a set square around the club. That's it. What, what's your thoughts on how that can change? Because to me, it, it, it's just we're, just, we're just tying the, the, the noose around our own necks with this stuff. Well, again, again, this is something I did manage to change, albeit for a very short period of time. I mean... I get come and I'm, I'm people I'm people find it hard to believe when I say this. Well, when I say people, people who are against it, I suppose. I, I'd get I'd get probably at least one call every week throughout the winter from people who couldn't get into a club. Now, from what I know, these people have never been in any trouble or caused any trouble within the pigeon sport. Sometimes it was down to the fact they were very good pigeon fans, yeah, maybe. And sometimes it was down to the fact that they perhaps were very outspoken um, why they couldn't get into clubs, both of which, in my opinion, are no reasons to refuse anybody membership. Now, I thought I need, I need to try and do something about this because it was raised, I raised it at council level and there was a discussion around it. And um, John Waters, who was vice president for the COVID issue, and a bloody good vice president, he he pushed the discussion around coming up with a solution via council. You know, we needed to address it, and he was keen to do that. He put forward a proposal, and council decided not to support it. Now, I went away and gave it some thought, and building on John's idea, I tried to improve it. I, I don't know if, if I did improve it or what, I don't know, but I basically wrote, wrote the new rule. Um, I went to the trouble of putting that through my club, and from my club to the region, the region supported it. And from there forward, it forwarded to the RPRA AGM. The rule was passed. Now, you'll recall, Mark, Rule 159B basically said that you could no longer refuse membership without giving a reason. You had to give a reason why you were refusing that person mem membership. And then that person had the right to appeal that decision to his local region. And the region would have the final decision on whether or not that person should be a member of the club. Now, accompanying the rule, I put a bit of an appendix together, which for, in an attempt to provide consistency, but also to give clubs and individuals some kind of guidance on where this rule was going, I, came, I, I listed some um, justifiable reasons, was the th I think the way it was called, that you could refuse membership, which were basically um, the person had been a default there, the person had been suspended, you know, those kind of things. Um, but re reasons, other reasons which weren't was obviously their ability to fly pigeons and, and, and that kind of simplistic things. Now, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a way of trying to tell certain people how to do their job. It was there as guidance and to, to ensure there was consistency applied across the 13 regions. Now, the proposition was passed at the AGM, probably what was that, not the last AGM, the AGM before, before COVID. Um, and that rule was in place for a 12-month and well, more than 12 months because we had COVID in between. But the, for the time it was in place, it did help genuine pigeon fanciers, and I stress genuine pigeon fanciers, to get into clubs. So pigeon fanciers who were unable to raise their pigeons at club level for a period of time were now in clubs. So from my point of view, I thought that was a, a positive move. Now, again, the rule probably won't perfect, and, but again, let's build on the rule and make it perfect to protect clubs and individuals. But what happened, coming back, going back to the AGM when it was passed, council then made the decision under their powers to get rid of the appendix. And at the time, I really couldn't understand why that was happening. I couldn't understand why you'd want to get rid of that appendix to the rule, which basically gives some guidance. Now, I, again, I might be being a bit cynical, but knowing what I know now and what was used to get rid of the rule, because the rule was voted out at the last AGM, people were pointing to the fact that what was applying in some regions to 
grant membership wasn't applying in other regions where people were becoming, or the, one of the reasons you, you could refuse membership was the person was already a member of another club or had resigned in another club within the last 12 months. So to stop people jumping out of one club into another club, you know, to stop that kind of thing. So they use that inconsistency, lo and behold, really, as a justification in some quarters to get rid of the rule. Now, I don't know if people read my annual review from the last AGM. It is available on the RPRA website. I mean, I was quite direct and outspoken in the AGM about lots of different subjects with the RPRA, um, including that rule. And I, and I pointed out, you know, we cannot as an association stand by and allow genuine pigeon fancies who have done nothing wrong not be able to race their pigeons. We as an association and them as a council in the 13 regions and the membership generally have to do have to come up with a solution. So the argument one of you guys in the WhatsApp group made about it being detrimental to the club, the evidence doesn't suggest that because these clubs that people went in, they, the clubs are still functioning. Mm. I mean, I, and people people accept it and get on with it and raise their pigeons finally. All right, not everybody, but you know something needs to happen. Well, our rule needs to come be, come back in. I think it does. Perhaps it needs to be improved. They'll you know, get feedback from different people and improve the rule, but. You know, there shouldn't be anybody refused from clubs. And, and as for people, we have dead dead spots in this country where some, certain bluffs don't don't fall into the boundary of any club. Now, that's a little bit more difficult. But again, I put a proposition forward through my club, went for the rigmarole, that in that instance, the person should be allowed to basket his pigeons at the nearest club and compete for federation honours. I think that happens in the Up North Combine and the, the, the NEHU. I mean, again, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? So that person can race his pigeons. He might not be competing at club level, but he can compete at federation level. Yeah. We could talk for another hour or two, but time is against us today. And what I would like to do is, as I say, definitely you come back on at some point to talk about your own uh, life with pigeons and also more ideas. I, You're one of the people that I like speaking to because you've got the ideas. Now you're out of the RPRA, it's a, you know, you, 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 I, I'd like to share ideas with people on the podcast and you've got other ideas about things. So I'd like to talk about moving the sport forward more and also um, explore more about you as a, as a pigeon flyer and, and, and your family and stuff. So maybe we can do that another time. Yeah, that'd be good. We've run out of time. But in the meantime, thank you for taking the time to. Um, to come up and, and be on this it's uh i've got a feeling it's going to be uh listened to or watched a lot this particular episode and uh yeah thank you Ian. thank you for coming oh, thank you mark and all the best thanks very much you've been listening to the rpi podcast check out more episodes at podcast.racingpigeoninternational.com 